Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for the event, and I welcome you. We have a really fascinating webinar for today um, on IT automation, but before we get started on it, I do need to go over just a few housekeeping items. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be receiving a link afterwards that will take you to the event on demand, and you can listen to it at your leisure. Also, we are going to be taking questions from the audience, so if you have a question for either of our panelists at any time during the webinar, please just use your control panel, submit your questions, and we'll take a couple minutes at the end of the presentation and go through those audience questions. Okay, with that, I would like to kick off today's webinar, Extreme IT Automation, a panel discussion. And if my computer wants to work here, there we go. Okay, our panelists today are Carl Levine, Senior Technical Evangelist at NS1, and Larry Solomon, Solution Strategy, North America Lead at CA. Hey guys, welcome to the webinar. Thanks for joining me today. Thank, Thank you, Charlene. All right, great. Well, before we get started, um, I'd like to ask both of you guys to introduce yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about your yourselves, your background, whatever you want the audience to know about you. Starting with you, Carl, go ahead. Terrific. Uh, yes, so hi, I'm Carl Levine. I'm Senior Technical Evangelist at NS1. We're a next generation managed DNS uh, software company. A uh, little bit about me, I've been uh, playing with this stuff for about 20 years, uh, DNS specifically for the last seven. Uh, so had my hand in all manner of different kind of networks, uh, both you know public and um, even embedded networks. Uh, so proto inter internet of things, I guess you could say. Um, and I live up here in New Hampshire and uh, that's about my life story. So there you go. <laughs> all right, great. Larry, how about you? Hi, my name is Larry Solomon. Carl and I obviously go to the same barber, so I uh, just wanted to <laughs> that. Um, uh, in all seriousness, uh, I'm a former developer myself, uh, nearly uh, 20 years, and then uh, you know, my, my current role, uh, which I've been in it for a bit now, is to uh, lead the North American solution strategy for DevOps within the automation BU at CA Technologies. All right, great. Excellent. Well, today's webinar is being um, is part of a uh, an extreme IT automation ebook that we've put together here at DevOps.com, and everybody who registered for today's webinar will be receiving a link probably tomorrow um, that will take you to the the ebook so you can download it uh, and have it for your very own. So. Um, Keep an eye out uh, in your email for that link tomorrow. And so let's get started with the questions here. So automation is really all about automating, right? So, you know, we think about, um, you know, all the different things that, that goes through the, the DevOps process, you know, the, the from, from soup to nuts, basically. and let's let's look at it from kind of the the holistic point of view when we talk about automation i'm you know i'm trying to figure out um and and hopefully uh, you guys can can kind of help me suss it out a little bit when we're talking about it automation where is a good place for companies to start when it comes to devops carl you want to start i mean you know Sure, I'll I'll kick that off. So I think that it, it's really important just to to bring it back to the basics of DevOps before we you know get into like the you know the how and what because you know at the end of the day you know DevOps is a is a cultural movement. It's you know everybody's got to be on board or have some semblance or idea of like what they want to achieve from you know getting a, a good repeatable and you know solid process in place for deploying uh, software or you know you know applications at scale. Uh, and so I think that you know having the people in place first is absolutely critical. Uh, beyond that, you know, there's different layers in the stack that can be automated. Obviously, uh, everything from you know you know build processes on you know customer facing applications to you know even internet infrastructure. You know the sort of layer of the stack where I live. So I think that you know wherever the company sees the most benefit from having the ability to 
get rid of a you know a manual process where something could be you know fat fingered and screwed up mm -hmm. uh, you know is certainly you know the best way to go so your mileage may vary on this okay makes sense L larry did you do you have anything that you want to add to that yeah absolutely i'll echo carl's sentiments as well you know one of the the basic tenets of devops is the columns initialism which is a uh, you know, C-A-L-M-S of cultural, as, as Carl mentioned, automation, uh, which is the only one of the five that actually refers to it, anything that's technology oriented, uh, lean process design, measurement and sharing. Uh, you know, so automation is, is a, absolutely a core tenet of, of DevOps, you know, because without that, basically everything else kind of falls apart. Really where uh, automation, where I have seen it being used the most, and this should be no surprise to anybody on the uh, on this webinar, uh, is obviously uh, automated uh, builds, you know, through continuous integration servers, uh, automated testing, because continuous testing, you know, for the feedback aspect of it, you know, in reference to the measurement uh, part of columns, uh, you know, just to be able to understand exactly where maybe things could be improved or where they're failing entirely. And then finally, uh, and again, what Carl mentioned, which is continuous uh, delivery, or if you take it a step further along in the maturity curve, continuous deployment. So, you know, really uh, to, to again, echo what Carl said, it really depends on where you think you're going to get the most benefit. Mm -hmm. Most companies start with Jenkins or some other uh, CI server, uh, just simply because it's something they're familiar with, everybody knows how to do builds, and, and Jenkins is pretty easy to set up and configure. But ultimately speaking, you're probably going to get the best long-term benefit not short-term low-hanging fruit, but long-term benefit from continuous uh, delivery or continuous deployment. Okay. All right. Great. So, you know, let's take let's take a step back then and and talk about what that you know the role of automation in DevOps. It's um, as you guys just said, it's it's critical, but. I mean, it's important, but it's not really that. That is not DevOps. I mean, that's it's it's a component of DevOps. It's 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 not enough by itself for a company to achieve success in DevOps. I mean, obviously, there are some other things that you know, Larry and Carl, you both kind of mentioned the culture, measurement, sharing, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, those are you know, those are important elements also. But um, you know, how I th I feel like a lot of people put almost too much emphasis on automation. Um, do you, is that something you guys see, or is or is it something that you know is do, do you see people kind of taking automation as you know the the it's critical, it's necessary. If we don't have automation, we're not going to do DevOps. And and maybe are they right in thinking that? Whoever I think wants to, to an, go first. To an extent, <laughs> you know, there, there's probably some truth to that, but I think that, you know, in general, being able to automate is sort of like the nirvana of, of DevOps. You know, again, going back to the whole, you know, cultural and organizational part of it, you know, the ability to identify the problems as a team and then figure out solutions that are, you know, pertinent to that situation and, you know, making them happen and eventually automating them, you know, is certainly like the, the end result. So for me, you know, personally, I see that as, you know, automation is like the, the ultimate sort of, you know, actualization of, of DevOps. Yes, I would agree as well. You know, it's, it's easy to look at DevOps as a standalone type of mentality or, or mindset that an organization has, but you cannot uh, neglect the fact that DevOps basically was a natural evolution of the agile uh, development uh, methodologies that existed, you know, in the early part of last decade and going forward. Absolutely. Uh, and so, yeah, you're absolutely right. So when you're looking at Agile, uh, you know, the whole point of Agile was basically, even though the, the manifesto says you're supposed to fail fast, really all it means is being able to release more quickly while not incurring additional operational risk. And so in order to be able to do that, you have to incorporate automation as a key aspect of that, because automation is not only going to allow you to um, to, to do things more quickly, but because automation forces you to codify the, the, the uh, deployment processes that you're using, for example, uh, you know, and you're putting it in there with all of the, the error checking and the contingency plans and stuff like that that's built into it, you know, that itself by definition becomes a, a consistent and repeatable process that's always going to give you the same result with the same uh, inputs being given to it. So, yes, right. it is absolutely a core component of it. So, I imagine it's also, um, you know, a, 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 hugely important that we have something automated so that we don't have 
having those manually compiled run books, um, having developers just kind of hold on to information in their heads and, you know, maybe for job security or for whatever reason, but, you know, they're not sharing that information in, in a way that uh, that is easily accessible for uh, all organizations or all components of the, uh, the, in the development process to, to be able to access. So um, automation, clears the path, so to speak. And, um, you know, it's also, uh, as you said, I think Larry earlier, those fat finger mistakes, there's, there's gotta be fewer of those with, with that, with the fast, faster cycles too. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of benefits to automation and, you know, but, but really it's not, it's not a flip the switch kind of scenario, right? I mean, um, it, it's, there's a certain amount of care for lack of a better word, that really has to be taken to ensure that the right processes are being automated and they're doing they're they're being automated in the right way. Um, you know, do you guys have any insight as to um, maybe some <laughs> some instances in which processes were automated that really didn't need to be processed or automated, or they they by their nature of being automated kind of mucked up the system, if you you know, if you will. I can't think of any good examples right off the top of my head. Uh, Larry, do you have any? That's an interesting question. Uh, yeah. You know, obviously the, the potential is always going to exist. You know, the, you know, Carl, you probably get a laugh out of this too, the whole garbage in, garbage out, uh, yep. I guess, concept from yeah. our debate, our days of development, our developers sure. comes, comes to mind here. So, you know, you're only going to automate things that are well-defined and mature from a process perspective. I mean, if you have a process that's ill-defined, and you automate it, it's just going to cause more problems more quickly and make it more difficult for you to remediate. So yes, the potential's there. I, I but like Carl, I can't think of anything off the yeah. top of my head. I, I no, think. That, but that's a valid point though, garbage in, garbage out. I mean, you know, I'm, I may, <laughs> I often joke, I say I'm a recovering product manager. Uh, <laughs> in my, in my <laughs> previous life, I, I did that um, for a, a major uh, infrastructure company. And I think that, you know, even in this, in this harkens back to that whole notion of the the agile methodology because I, you know, yeah, I was in standups and you know, you know, retros and all those happy meetings uh, on the daily. So I think that you know what what often came out of those were you know things that were ill scoped from the beginning, never really you know had the ability to be automated effectively. And so you know, obviously you know coming back to the you know, the whole agile thing, you know. Having a, a clearly set, you know, like just defined list of variables and like, you know, outcomes that you want to see from a, you know, you know, a sprint, uh, an epic or even, you know, any sort of time quanta that you're working with, you, you know, without having adequate scope and adequate, you know, outcomes, you're, you're basically doing, you know, <laughs> you're just spinning your wheels. And I think the same parable can be attached to automating processes if there is yeah. no you know, really defined outcome and like, you know, very mature process that, you know, has been tested, you know, with, with actual people doing the work, uh, you know, that is certainly a challenge then to try and automate something that, I mean, you can't automate what is not already, you know, manually mm -hmm. done. So, yeah, yeah. I'll, if I can add to what Carl just said, because that reminds me of a situation I came across once I was speaking with a company uh, and they had a uh, several, um, I guess departments that were doing software development and delivery in their own way, and they were looking to standardize on a, you know, I guess best practices type of uh, deployment model. But at the same time, they were also looking to incorporate automation, which they had not done previously. And, and you know, again, it's that's a recipe for disaster because, like Carl said, you got to have the people who are already doing it. You've already tested it. You've already validated that it works the way it's supposed to be uh, to be working, at least in, even if it's manual before you can actually start to incorporate automation into this to make it, I guess, more effective or efficient. So, mm -hmm. you know, trying to bite off more than you can chew or I guess the cliche boil the ocean uh, can absolutely be detrimental. Make sure you have everything already defined first and you understand exactly what the inputs and the outputs are and what the, uh, the I guess, the objectives of, of, of the process are before you attempt to automate it. Right. Well, that, that makes sense. You know, you, you, you can't, if you, if you don't know how a process works, how can you even begin to try and automate it? Because you, you've got to have an understanding of how, you know, if, if it's a manual process now, you got to think about all those different steps that it goes through and whether you as if, if it is a manual process, how 
how manual is that manual process, so to speak? You know, how many times are you going right. in and kind of, you know, flipping the dials and, you know, turning the switches? And, and so um, it's, it, it's, it does take that that kind of thorough um, knowledge base to be able to uh, to even consider automating something like that. But you know, it, it's it, isn't there also kind of a cultural um, thing to automation when you when you talk about automating certain processes? Uh, I mean, you're not just impacting, say, your job or somebody else's. You, you're kind of impacting the, the whole team um, in the way that uh, that they work. And it's all of a sudden everything gets automated and they're not prepared for that. I imagine that could potentially lead to some problems. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you're absolutely correct. So uh, I guess the this is not your father's software deployment. Um, you, know, you know, when I and Carl, I mean, you said based on your 20 years, you probably experienced this as well. Back in the early days, you know, when we wanted to deploy a new build of a software, it was literally just, hey, copy a file from one directory to another, you know, an executable. Yep. Or, uh, I mean, I'm dating myself. I go back to the old OS2 days. So, I mean, DLLs, I guess, or DOS days, you know, when just EXEs. You know, but, you know, nowadays, you know, software deployment involves so much more than just deploying a bunch of executables. I mean, you know, if you take the uh, the term from, or if you borrow it from ITIL, you're really deploying business services, which could mean multiple applications. You know, uh, uh, one of the groups of companies that I deal with are the global banks. And I remember the first time I went into uh, one of the banks and I'd asked the person who was responsible for uh, the data center where all of the test environments were, were hosted. And I said, and we were talking about one particular application for the investment bank. And I said, do you have a reference architecture and he says, yeah, sure. And he goes and prints something out and he brings me this like legal sized piece of paper with like 14 or 15 boxes and some lines connected to it. And I said to him, I said, it's not very often that I get a component level diagram of an application. He goes, no, that's not a component level diagram. Each one of those boxes is an individual application. And this shows the data flow and the dependencies between them. And so the point that I'm trying to make is that when you're releasing something, you have to often be aware of the fact that there's multiple applications with integration points. And because there's multiple applications, you have multiple development teams multiple release cadences, multiple release schedules, and you have to be aware of all of those in addition to all of the interdependencies between them. Finally, and here's where it gets even more complicated, there are other parts of the ecosystem you absolutely have to be aware of. ITSM, for example, if you're deploying to production, you very frequently are not even allowed to, to initiate anything until you've created a change request and had it approved by the change approval board. So you have to be able to integrate with like the ServiceNow team, for example. And the moment you get them involved, they're the ones that like to be in control of everything because that's the overarching process from a governance perspective that rules everything within the uh, within the IT infrastructure. So you're absolutely correct. You can't just automate things that involve other teams and expect to be able to, to get everybody to come together and hold hands and sing Kumbaya. You have to absolutely get buy-in from them as well as be able to listen to and address every one of their own concerns too. No, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, would I, was also, just, I was just agreeing. <laughs> yeah, no, okay. Well, I was also going to say, you know, not only that, they may have some insight into how automating a particular uh, you know, uh, task or, or whatever will um, impact other parts that, that you're not thinking about. You know, it, it may not even come to mind, but they their insight can probably uh, help make you help you make that determination whether something actually should be automated. True. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Great. So then the question becomes, can there ever be too much automation? I hmm. say yes. I say yes, because I think that, you know, you you don't want to automate just for the sake of automation. If it's if it's not significantly improving the process by saving time or or um, you know giving you fewer things to do in your day, making your life a little easier, um, I say it's not oh. worth automating. What do you? I I completely agree with you, Charlene. Uh, I think that you know to to our earlier points, you know the. You know, automation is a means to an end. It is when, you know, a manual process drags on and, you know, hits that sort of, you know, diminishing point of return where you're actually putting human capital towards getting something done and it's actually detracting from the ability to get other things done. Mm -hmm. This is how you incur technical debt, you know, right. and I think that that's, you know, one of the, you know, one of the big things that's strangling a lot of companies right now is, you know, this 
this notion of tech debt and having so many unfinished projects because they've put so much time and energy into you know manually doing something that could have very easily been automated uh, and then you know then it becomes almost this kind of you know it, it's cyclical because then once it's once it's moving you know it becomes well now we don't have the time to automate that because we have to get x y and z done by you know the end of the quarter to meet this business goal and it and it then rolls up from being like an engineering team issue into a, a business level issue. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where things get really messy. So I think that, you know, the right amount of automation at the right time will net, you know, good results for a business. But, you know, going and trying to automate everything is, it's a fool's errand. I mean, you're essentially, you know, going and, you know, automating things that, you know, could just as easily be knocked out by somebody in 10 minutes uh, you know, versus, you know, spending days, hours, weeks writing, you know, unit tests, function tests, you know, to automate something that honestly doesn't take a lot of time out of someone's day. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I was going to be a, I was going to be cautiously, uh, a cautious contrarian, here, but I'm not so, <laughs> you know, so, you know, so Carl's point to technical debt is incredibly valid and it's something you have to be uh, obviously aware of. From my perspective, everything has to have a payback to it you know kind of what carl was saying was that you know if there's an effort there has to be you know or, or cost there has to be a return on investment so i i guess this is really where the onus is on the senior management within a company to really uh have spent the time and this goes to the cultural aspect that, that carl mentioned several times and you know, the C of the Calms and uh, initialism. It, it, the onus is on senior management to really put some thought into the strategic aspects of adopting or uh, starting a DevOps initiative. Because if you're just automating, as you both have said, just for the sake of automating, it's probably not worth the time. However, you also, from on the flip side of that, you can also take the viewpoint that it may not provide a great return right now but realizing that by automating this seemingly trivial process and allowing that automation to be, I guess, initiated by another process that's also automated may allow me to achieve some sort of payback via economies of scale. So I guess my, my point is I'm saying yes and no in the same point, mm -hmm. at the same point. I agree with both of you. I guess it really just matters uh, you know, on what the specifics of the situation are. Yeah, well, what about that's that's great though I you know completely valid I think that you know if if a process you know if the byproduct of automating a larger process can help take care of a small process great you know lump it in there I, that's I think that's a great idea but what about complexity I mean if you're automating all the things um, you're adding a level of complexity that that may not necessarily be there otherwise and you, aren't you kind of pushing a lot of that management over to somebody else to handle and and kind of making their life a little bit more miserable in the process? Well, I guess that depends on the mechanics of how you're actually automating it. So, you know, there are solutions on the, you know, out in the market now which are um, where they kind of hide the complexity for you by providing okay. some sort of like a declarative types of automation. And then there are other types who are more, uh, you know, explicit in the way that they force you to create the automated workflows, more like a Visio type of a chart. So I guess to, to answer your point specifically, the mechanics could make the automation self-documenting in a way. So if you had a Visio flowchart, you can get at a glance, you obviously won't get all the details, but you can certainly see what the process looks like overall. And that, that kind of eliminates some of the complexity because you're able to more easily uh, consume it visually. By the way, that also, I guess future proofs the automation to a certain extent as well because because as attrition occurs in an organization and somebody else comes on if you have something that's somewhat self-documenting that does somewhat decrease the, the learning curve to make them effective in managing the automation process itself so I, again i guess it depends on the specific manner in which you're automating processes carl yeah i i completely agree with you like All that right. that, that just makes sense <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes sense to me too, but you know, yeah. I've got to bring it up anyway. So, yeah. 
<laughs> All right, great. Well, before we move ahead, I do want to remind the audience that we are taking questions. So if you have a question uh, for Larry or for Carl, please um, go ahead and use your control panel, uh, submit your questions, and we'll take them as uh, when we get done with our big discussion here. And uh, hopefully we'll have about uh, 15, 20 minutes near the end to, to go over the audience questions. Right okay, on. moving ahead. Will we be will will automation basically render us all unemployable? Um, Absolutely are we not. Going to be automated out of the job. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Now they. No, I think that that would be like the manifestation of like every every movie where like a you know robot becomes sentient and uh, well, you know, I, we are Borg. You will be assimilated, right? I, I, exactly. I, I, yep. I will admit that I hear automation and I automatically think of now. Skynet. Yeah, exactly. Terminator, <laughs> Skynet. I'm like, oh my god. Um, this is what I have to worry about now. Is you forgot, you, you, you forgot to add the hashtag Skynet to the end of that, that statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Never far from my thoughts. No, I'm kidding. But um, it just there are, there's there are people out there that are I won't say scared to death, but I mean this is this is a valid um, point that they're trying to make. You know, automation has the potential to um, make our lives so much more uh, comfortable and convenient, but you know, it, at what price? I think it's the harbinger of innovation. If if I'm completely honest, I think that you know, if if you know, little you know, piddly processes can be you know automated away. You know, that gives the engineer you know, be it a, a full stack engineer or even you know just somebody that just codes all day. You know, it gives them that that freedom. It actually opens up their mind and allows them to not worry about the, you know, the minutia of their job and actually focus on bigger picture and, you know, more visionary stuff, so that they can you know be a better, you know, teammate to their you know fellow squad members. You know, if they're in that agile methodology. Yeah, this is an interesting question because I you know, from my perspective, I don't think we'll ever be automated out of a job. However, we have to give a nod to the current trends of intelligent automation, or sometimes we hear AI ops is another, mm -hmm. uh, another term. So you know, I guess the, the, it remains to be seen exactly how pervasive those two movements will ultimately become. Uh, you know, if you read articles on, you know, training neural networks and things like that, they will tell you that they're good at performing certain types of tasks, but that's because that's what the neural network, for example, was designed to do. Image recognition is a perfect example of this, but you can't mm -hmm. take a neural network that was designed to recognize images and expect it to be able to perform complex tasks. That's not what it was built to do. Right. So uh, to this point, it, I think things like IA, intelligent automation will be, uh, will be useful in and taking the tasks that automation are currently used for and just making them better able to respond to boundary conditions that maybe weren't properly accounted for in the first place. But I don't believe that we will ever be automated out of a job. I mean, after all, you know, IT or businesses, if we expand it or, you know, take it up another, uh, uh, another layer, uh, you know, businesses are very complex machines and, mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of people to figure out the best way to, to make all of the moving cogs in that machine work in the most efficient manner possible. And I just don't see any way that automation, even with machine learning or AI behind it, are going to be able to replace people. I mean, they're still going to be necessary to interpret what's what needs to be done and actually describe the process to be automated. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Larry. That's, that's a very valid point. So do we need to be concerned with um, perhaps, you know, placing limits on what should be automated or should we put controls on automation in general to kind of help us uh, maybe stem the uh, any potential uh, uh, you know automation going out of control so to speak you think we'll ever get to that point i guess i should ask that first and then if so um, you know what? What can we do about it now? Okay, I'll I'll take. I don't a want to be the one to predict the downfall. Of All right, <laughs> I'll, 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 take a, I'll take a stab at this. Okay, so obviously, you know, uh, you know, if you're if you're thinking about this, you know, the flash crashes 
of the algo traders, the algorithmic traders on, on Wall Street come to mind immediately when you talk about, you know, automation running amok. And that's basically what happened. These were automated trades that were being placed by uh, systems that were using uh, mathematical modeling to, to try to take advantage of arbitrage in the markets. And they basically crashed the entire market because they were executing trades much more quickly than anybody could actually, uh, you know, process mentally. So mm -hmm. is the potential there? Yes. Um, I imagine, depending on the types of processes being automated, that maybe controls may, or throttles may be uh, worthwhile to put in place. If we're, let's let's get back to DevOps for a second though, when you're talking about uh, being able to release applications more quickly, I don't necessarily think it'll be uh, needed. You know, if you look at companies like Amazon or Facebook right now, I mean, Amazon I think rolls out something to production once every 23 seconds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not, you can't move much faster than that anyway. I mean, it, I can't imagine that anybody's able to process, you know, this, if, you know, uh, what's actually happening at any given point in time easily. They just trust that the system works. Now, granted, Amazon's probably taking a risk-based approach. So if you're just, you know, deploying cascading style sheets, for example, you know, where you're changing the color of a, of, of a bunch of text, that's probably low risk and we can roll it out immediately. I don't think that they're rolling out executables every 23 seconds. Uh, but the point that I'm trying to make is that when you're talking about application deployments, then uh, automation throttles probably aren't necessary if the process being automated was designed properly to begin with. Again, garbage in, garbage out. Yep. Adequate scoping, adequate exactly. you know, planning, and you know, really just focusing on what the problem is you're trying to solve with automation. So. Okay. It's you know, it, it's a conversation that we even on DevOps, we've you know, we've had many conversations about automation and um, have run a couple articles on the impact of automation on. Uh, you know the IT population in general, and and we brought up um, the idea of a, you know a universal income because certain people um, may no longer have a job because of automation. And and granted, those are more probably low lower skilled, low level type jobs. But um, you know, do you do you think we'll ever get to a point where there's um, where automation actually has perhaps wiped out a, a, an entire level of uh, m tasks or, or jobs that, that people are doing today that uh, you know just may not exist in the future because of automation? I mean, this, this goes you know, even beyond the bounds of just our immediate industry. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was out in you know, Portland, Oregon a couple of weeks ago after Monitorama and had a few days between that and the uh, Velocity Conference I went to down in San Jose. So I took a drive down the uh, the West Coast. And my first stop, I, I you know had neglected to grab breakfast. And I walked into a McDonald's, which is a very rare thing for me. <laughs> yeah. It's been quite a while since I've been into a McDonald's. And there was a screen. It's all kiosks. order my food. A kiosk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, wow, tomorrow's world. It's here. Uh, so I ordered up my breakfast sandwich, my coffee, and my hash browns. And... Um, then it said, well, the printer is, or the card reader is failed. So you, it prints out a slip and I still had to go and, you know, hand it to somebody. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, as long as we're automating things for humans, humans are going to have to play a big role in, you know, making sure that it all goes to plan and be that, you know, plan B in case something mm -hmm. does, you know, go awry. And so to that end, I, you know, regardless of, you know, what and where automation, you know, kind of comes into our lives, at the end of the day, you know, we are still the people who, you know, came up with this stuff. Uh, we are, you know, we created the computer, we created the internet, we created, you know, software, you know, development environments and testing tools and all the, you know, stuff that we use today. And it, at the end of the day, you know, there's still going to be a person behind that. And I think that, I, I don't see a world where we will ever, you know, see any level of employment or other, you know, sort of vocation done away completely with uh, automation. Or, or might sort be, of, they, or they might cut, might cut back. They right. might, you know, 
or, yeah. or certainly people will, can can learn new skills. So you know, yeah. go back to the whole uh, General Motors incorporating uh, robotics on their automobile assembly line back in the eighties. You know, yeah. that's everybody was predicting the apocalypse at that point. Oh my God, <laughs> we're all going to be redundant. Oh. Well, you know, it was the eighties, so there was a yeah, lot going I, on. <laughs> agreed, but I mean, but you know, fast forward now, we have the benefit of uh, twenty. 30, no, actually 20, God, I, I can I can subtract one to college. Uh, 40 years of hindsight to look at this. And no, it certainly didn't do what people were predicting back then. Yeah. Now, on the flip side, you know, maybe people did not need to do what the robots are doing instead. But now you need robot technicians, for example, you know, robotics technicians and things like that. So, you know, while if you look at things in a very static sense and say, oh, my gosh, well, you're, you know, humans are doing this now, you know, automation is going to be doing it. Oh my God, the poor humans aren't going to be able to do anything. No, that's not true. Nothing is static and everything is dynamic in nature. And so the people that were doing things that are now automated will now have the opportunity to manage the automation or do something even more important than that. Yeah, they're not risking their lives. I mean, exactly. you know, the whole purpose of, you know, automating, you know, automotive assembly lines was to cut down on the number of repetitive motions and, and dangerous tasks. You know, somebody operating a spot welder to, you know, mount a, you know, piece of a firewall to a, you know, the rest of the unibody. I mean, yeah, a robot can do that much more efficiently. Their, you know, their, their coveralls aren't going to catch on fire from sparks. Uh, their eyes won't burn out from, you know, the constant, you know, zap of, you know, you know, ultra white light, you know, happening when the metal fuses together. And, you know, that, you know, so that had a, a profound positive impact on, mm -hmm. you know, the human uh, side of things. And of course, yes, that person who would have otherwise been, you know, tacking in that same joint on every, you know, Buick Regal coming down the line, uh, they, you know, probably found some other place within the organization where their skills could be used. And, you know, that expertise and, you know, whatever, you know, career moves they had after that, you know, was a positive uh, impact on their life. Yeah, well, one, one could hope, and and that's I think that's kind of the crux of the argument for certain people is, you know, we're we have the potential to eliminate these these low level tasks, and the people who have these low or who are doing these low level tasks are, you know, they're they're probably you know lower education. Um, mm -hmm. don't really have the opportunity uh, or the means to be able to go back and learn a new trade. Um, and those are the people who um, some some people argue are going to be left behind uh, when when we move to a, a much more automated society. And that's that's way beyond DevOps and and I oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a larger a whole, that's that's like that's a you socioeconomic know, that's discussion a, of uh, that's a happy yeah. hour conversation, definitely. <laughs> you know, it's well, next time next yeah, time you want to hear about that, you find me. We'll, we'll chat. Scotch. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bring up the scotch. <laughs> But there you, you know, <laughs> one, yeah, there we go. The one thing I did want to actually point out when um, your your McDonald's, um, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the, when you went by automating that process, McDonald's actually made it more complex for you and for them because you are the one who actually had to go up and tap your order on the screen. But you, but it there was now an extra step. You had to go and present your debit card or credit card to somebody else to process it. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, you know, it, it, I, that's a perfect example, I think, of, of maybe making uh, a task a little bit more complex by automation. Well, yeah, that's, 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 you're, that's, you're an right. interesting, that's an interesting point. It's not really something that uh, the my comment here does not really uh, uh, related to the will we be automated out of a job question that's being displayed. Yeah. <laughs> But the, uh, the your point is, is uh, begs the question then, uh, or maybe not even begs the question, but begs the statement mm -hmm. that automation by itself is fine and dandy, but without the visibility into what's really happening, as well as any you know trends that are developing from a, a failure analysis perspective, or what's mm -hmm. my operational efficiency gains that I'm receiving as a result of this as well. I mean, the visit, the, the the dashboards and the analytics absolutely have to be there to a justify what you did. I mean, hopefully you know that before you started it, but maybe validate the justification that you proposed in the beginning, but also potentially to identify hot spots in the process where. Um, you know, where maybe future or further automation is required. So back to Carl's statement regarding the McDonald's. Yeah, it may seem more onerous, but then I'm, you know, Carl, I mean, I'm sure you, you've, you've run into this as well. You're, you're in an airport, 
You've mm -hmm. got you know 30 minutes to get to the plane. You got to the airport later. Maybe security was just a pain in your butt, and you're yeah, rushing. Always down. the latter. Always. Yeah, the latter. But it, it, always. I yeah. No no joke. <laughs> and, and, and so you're you're running through like the Newark Terminal C down uh, to get to your gate. It's always the furthest from the mm -hmm. your gate's always the furthest geographically from the security yeah. checkpoint, which is that's always the case. And you get to the point where you want to get something to eat, and the line is backed up, and you got a 30 minute wait. So mm -hmm. in that instance, maybe the kiosk isn't such a bad deal after all because presumably people are going to be able to some people are going to stay in line because they just want to talk to a person but other people are going to go to the kiosks and ultimately that kind of maybe basically distributes the load a little better so you know you may have to punch a couple of buttons but in the long run it may end up being more efficient for you different but different kind of load balancing that i'm used to but yeah that's yeah. a valid point. <laughs> but, but it's you know if they have to end up standing in line to get their their transaction process then yeah it's, true yeah Anyway, yeah, I, I have a feeling this is this is actually a conversation that could go on and on and on. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the next slide. But before I do, I want to remind the audience again that if you have a question or even a comment, I mean, we'd love to hear about you, about what's going on with you guys too. So go yeah, ahead and use your control. We've got panel. a few here in the hopper. So yeah, yeah. So I look forward to um, answering those shortly. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's um uh. Uh, it's time then to move on to the next slide. So, okay, so let's kind of circle back to the beginning and, and uh, talk about really what we have discussed in the webinar so far. Um, and then I wanna give you guys a couple minutes to talk about your companies. Um, so automation, it's important. It's part of the DevOps equation. It's not the be all end all in DevOps. There are other uh, factors to consider. Um, and, you know, people still matter with automation. I think we just kind of uh, uh, beat that dead horse um, mm -hmm. so hard. And uh, it's, uh, but it's an important, it's an important point to make. Um, you know, automation is, uh, it's designed to improve our lives, to, uh, to improve operational efficiencies. Uh, to, to basically allow us to have a life again. Um, and uh, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's really nothing that needs to be um, uh, scared. You, people don't need to be scared of it. People don't need to, you know, it's automation is our friend. Um, but that said, there can be too much, uh, too much automation. It, I think, Companies really, really need to think long and hard about what exactly they're automating, whether it actually does improve the process, whether it actually does uh, help in the um, in the software de development lifecycle, um, and you know whether it's good for the business in general. So, um, gentlemen, I want to um, uh, get your uh, your input on these takeaways. Is there anything? that is not listed here that you think is really uh, important for the audience to know about when it comes to automation. Why don't we start with you, Carl? Yeah, so I, I guess to, to add to this, I would just say that, you know, DevOps, and, and I'll reiterate my, my first statement and all this too, is that DevOps is a cultural thing first and foremost. Having buy-in from all levels of the business and being able to have an effective feedback loop about how things are working, what could be improved, what could be automated, <laughs> uh, you know, these things all really, you know, play a really important role in just how this is all, uh, all done, you know, in the context of business. Uh, so without feedback loop, you know, there's, there's no point in automating because there's no, you know, feedback on just how well it's working or, you know, what the uh, actual, you know, economic or, you know, you know, occupational gains or losses even were from, uh, you know, embarking on that endeavor. All right, great. Larry? Yeah, yeah, I agree with Carl, absolutely. So in ITIL, again, going back to that uh, framework, you know, there's the concept of continual service improvement. Yeah, feedback loops are absolutely critical because if you're not able to measure it, you can't improve it. Uh, right. So, you know, you have to have the ability to examine what's been happening, what's working, what's not, and be able to address the inefficiencies. You know, and just to kind of summarize this slide as well, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, to remember is uh, you have to respect the process uh, you know, it's not just a matter of copying an executable from one directory uh, to another anymore. You know, there's a lot more involved when it comes to automation from within a DevOps context 
Uh, and so there's there's the process, there's the governance surrounding the process in terms of approvals and that kind of stuff that you have to also take into consideration. And then the second point is that you're never automating the entire business. You know, so you, you may have, um, I guess, you know, a small portion of the software development strategy or operation within your domain of control, but that's never going to be everything that needs to be uh, take, taken into consideration when you're deploying, you know, an entire software release. You know, you have other groups that you have to worry about. We talked about ITSM, for example, and so being able to address those areas of integration, both from a process perspective and a technology perspective, is also cr critical to ensuring the uh, the success of any automation initiative that your organization undertakes. Yeah. Right, great. I, I like that. Respect the process. Respect I like the process. Wow. I could, it looks like, it sounds like something that should be on a wall somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Well, uh, at this point, I uh, would like to actually uh, invite Carl to um, uh, tell us a little bit about this particular slide here <laughs> as it relates wow. to NS1. <laughs> so it, lo it looks like the top of it got chopped off, but uh, wow. we are NS1. We're a next generation managed DNS company. Uh, so we are the leader in solutions that orchestrate the delivery of the world's most critical internet and uh, enterprise applications. So our purpose built platform transforms the venerable DNS uh, layer, you know, the little protocol it's been around for about 35 years and uh, maps names to numbers uh, we've made that into an intelligent efficient and automated system that you know exists within the stack driving dramatic gains uh, in reliability resiliency security and performance of application delivery infrastructure and you know we've built this on a, a modern API first architecture with an easy to use interface but it also because it is API first uh, is part and parcel of you know the sort of infrastructure end of automation. Uh, so spinning up and spinning down ephemeral resources like, you know, cloud instances or you know, even, you know, failing over between, you know, data centers or adjusting load based on, you know, metrics from various servers. Uh, so we, you know, fancy ourselves, you know, as a, you know, an automation for a part of the stack that is often overlooked. And so that's, uh, that's where we kind of fit into the game. All right, great. And Larry, why don't I turn it over oh. to you to talk about this one? Okay. Uh, well, yeah, so I work for CA Technologies. A lot of com uh, people remember it maybe as Computer Associates. It's a company that's been around for a long time. Uh, you know, so CA is a company that has traditionally been viewed as an enterprise infrastructure management company uh, or even a mainframe company going back to its roots in the early 80s. Uh, back in uh, 2011, CA made a huge shift in their strategic approach to IT and made a significant investment in DevOps, uh, you know, from an acquisition and internal development perspective. Uh, and the and the software portfolio that it's you know that it's built up over time since then has really addressed a lot of different issues or a lot of areas of software development. Uh, you know, whether it's continuous testing uh, you know, and, and types of principles, design aspects, uh, with the acquisition of Rally Software. Uh, you know, with the acquisition of Atomic uh, just uh, last year, you know, the automation aspects of it as well. And there's and so many other parts of it. You know, the reason why that CA has made those types of investments is because of what this slide's uh, detailing right here is that there, there's a recognition that in order to, I hate to, to, to coin or to refer to this modern software factory term that comes straight out of the commercials I'm sure you've seen, <laughs> but there are, there, there are several components to successful uh, you know application development and deployment you know and it starts by understanding exactly what value you're bringing with this uh, create an agile business understand where, you, where you're able to increase the value so that you're able to take advantage of market economics uh, and then you have to be able to respond appropriately at building your better apps faster while again not incurring additional operational risk making sure that security is is absolutely first and foremost a first-class citizen you know that's something that often gets overlooked uh you know and uh you know devsecops is finally starting to get its day in, in the sun which is always nice and then finally once the application has been developed and deployed making sure that it's operating appropriately so you know automation has a play in every one of these four steps here that are listed and so uh you know ca like uh, other companies we have the ability to add value to all of these Okay, great. Well, thank you both, gentlemen. I, I really, uh, 
I appreciate that. And Absolutely. we're gonna go ahead and start taking questions from the audience. If you have a question, as I've said before, please uh, use the uh, control panel uh, on your desktop and go ahead and uh, submit your questions. And I'm having a little mouse problem here, so I can't actually look at the questions. Let me, hold on. Let me just I say, break. last time I had a mouse problem, I just set traps. That, that didn't <laughs> there we go. Problems. So let's see. Um, okay, well, right now we don't have any questions from the audience, but uh, um, you know, uh, I, hold on. I see a, I see a well, few. I see a few here. Yeah. Okay, can you go ahead? I'm sorry because for some reason I'm not able to. Yeah. Uh, they're not showing up on my screen. Sure. So you, well, you we're going to run through this. Yeah. All right. Go so ahead. yeah, so we got Deborah Martin who asks, "What if you have a scenario where you have a third-party resource that need you know have to participate in your deployment process? How would you automate something like that? And what would be a best practice to address something like that?" And also says, "Note there are contractual obligations with our third-party vendors to consider." Uh huh. Mm -hmm. so, so what do you guys that think? Little, that little <laughs> wrench in the works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I you know I'll I'll just kind of preface this by saying I mean. You know, a lot of times when there is a you know third party involved, you know, obviously project management plays a big part in this. Product management plays a big role in this. And you know, if there's actual teams that are working together with the resources from the third parties, it's important that everybody you know is on the same level playing field. That the expectations are set, you know, from the get go, knowing what the outcome should be. Uh, and that entirely varies based on you know organizational structure, organizational strategy. Uh, just in just in general, just how the two you know companies work together to deliver that uh, you know that solution. Okay, great. Yeah, Deborah. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, um, you know, how are you currently accomplishing this, and what value would automation bring? Uh, even if you're automating only a partial part of the process, you know, that's going to be better than doing everything manually. You know, you know, forget the speed. You know, just repeatability. You know. Um, uh, the ability, the ability to triage and remediate easily because you have the output of all of the steps, that kind of stuff easily accessible. You know, all of those kind of things are really going to provide some sort of impact to this. So, you know, the the amount of impact obviously is going to be uh, dependent on the specifics of the situation. You know, but I understand what you're saying though. And as a matter of fact, I remember uh, dealing uh, with a uh, another bank, and uh, they wanted to have an approval for the deployment right smack in the middle of the deployment workflow. Uh, you know. And uh, well, I mean, no, it's not that it was a bad thing. I mean, approvals are, <laughs> approvals are, are you know part and parcel of the deployment process, especially when you're going into production, for example. Um, and I basically said to them, you know, normally you would put the approval before you actually initiate the process. Just, no, in this particular instance, and he, they gave me the, the the specifics of the situation, but they needed to have a deployment right in the middle of it. What does that do from the time to completion? Obviously, you're now you're dependent on somebody, you know, reviewing and responding in, a, in an appropriate time frame. Can't be great. But by the same token, they were doing that deployment already. I mean, the, the the approval already with a fully manual process. So it's not going to be any worse than it was. So if you have to incorporate third-party involvement, that's fine, Deborah. I don't think that you'll have any issues uh, incorporating them. You may not get the the greatest amount of payback, but it'll certainly be better than what you're currently doing. Right on. Excellent. All right, looks like our, our next question comes to us from uh, Vignesh Gopal, uh, who wants to know, how do we manage a conversation with a client when the request is to automate a broken process? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brutal honesty, that's yeah. what I do. I say, look, <laughs> you know, let's, let's not waste any time here. Your time is important, your you know, time is money. Uh, your process is broken. <laughs> we need to take a step back. It's not ready to automate yet, let's, you know, let's maybe take a, a you know finer grain look at what you're trying to accomplish and see what we can do to maybe get that process into a place where it could be automated at some point, but right now is not that time. Exactly. That's, that's the exactly. conversation I had. Yeah, because you, the first question you should be asking them is, what are you hoping to accomplish with automation that you're not that you're uh, that you're not accomplishing right now? All it's going to do is fail faster. Right. I mean, if, if the process is broken, it's not going to get magically fixed. If that were the case, I'd be tacking on another two two zeros to the end of the price point, right? Uh, you know, I mean, all, all kidding aside, you know, automation is not going to be some magic panacea that all of a sudden just you know appears out of nowhere and you wave your magic wand and all your problems get fixed. I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out. Well, do you right? think that that's um, is that a do people think that automation is going to fix a broken process? I mean, do they is it 
is is that the problem there or is it just kind of you know hope and a prayer that you know that maybe this is this is the way to go because you can, it's you can not never working automate out. your problems away that's yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it's ignorance uh, then. It. I don't well, know. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's just an educational issue. So, you know, it's kind of a funny anecdotal story. When I first got involved with computers back in junior high school, you know, I thought mm -hmm. that computers were like these awesome things that you saw in the movies, which, you know, back in the, you know, whatever, 70s or 80s, early 80s, the movies weren't, weren't that great. First thing I did when I wanted to, I, I was a big video game addict. I wanted to go to my, my Radio Shack TRS-80 Model 1. And I wanted, to, and I want, yeah, the trash eighty. And I wanted to, <laughs> trash and I, had a, I had a cassette for Dazdy, you know, Dazdy for all the old mainframe people. <laughs> Right here, I had a cassette-based storage system, and I wanted to write Space Invaders. And so, you know, rather than you know, as programmers, we all know how you you know do stuff like this now. But back then, I didn't know what I was doing. I said, create 100 Space Invaders and let them descend at the rate of blah blah blah. And I tried to describe in plain old English what this was going to do, and 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 I was shocked when I got a syntax error. I, I, yeah, <laughs> basic was basic, but not yeah, that pretty, basic. Yeah, pretty much. Well, the, <laughs> the point the point being is that if people are expecting automation to fix a broken process, it's probably because they don't really understand what the benefits of automation are to begin with, and how it should be applied successfully. And that's really an educational issue. All that right, great. And well, I wish I could see the questions. Um, I don't know there's, how many more we there's, have. There's a couple more here. So actually, Vignesh had a, another question after that. He, he wanted to know, uh, so how do we address the trade-off between adopting a change in process when manual is compared, or when manual, as compared to when it's already automated? So the, the, well, the trade-off. Oh, yeah, well, go I ahead, think that, I think, Yeah, I think that what he's asking is, you know, how do you compare the level of effort to modifying a process that's already been automated, modifying whatever workflows or whatever it is that you have in place versus just making a, a change in some documentation uh, and, and and going on your own merry way if it was completely manual. At the end of the day, there's always going to be some upfront cost when it comes to automation. You know, But the, the point is, is that if, if you're automating the right types of processes, then the payoff becomes substantial because that process is going to be executed multiple times, you know, hundreds or thousands even uh, of times. And so therefore the small amount of effort that you put up front to properly design the process from, from the perspective of what automation capabilities you have at hand is going to really pay off for you. So if you have an already automated process, making a, a change, if it's minor, obviously it should not be that big of a deal, but if it's a major one even, then you're probably still going to get a payoff and over time, just a question of if that payoff is substantial enough. Okay. All right. Let's Guys, see. I can see the questions now. Yay. Oh, good. All yeah. right. So, <laughs> so Charlene, right. kick us off. What's our Thanks. next one? Thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we are about four minutes to the top of the hour, so I think we have pretty much time for one more, and then we'll go ahead and um, just close it out. But uh, if we don't get to your questions, these guys are going to get a copy of the question. So I'm sure uh, one of them or both of them will be able to uh, follow up with you offline. Um, OK, so here's here's a, a good one uh, that we actually didn't even uh, go over. So hopefully uh, you, we can do it in two minutes or less. Can you comment on the trend for addressing compliance and governance with automation? Hmm. Ha, that's <laughs> yeah. this is always a good question. So. So I, I'm assuming that this question is addressing or is, is referring to like uh, requirements within Sarbanes-Oxley or COVID compliance if yeah. you're using a non-regulatory based uh, standard set of standards. Yeah, and, and primarily both of those, and I'm sure others as well, refer to developer access to production. And that's the that's the the big glaring 800 pound gorilla normally when you're talking about automating deployments because a lot of times in in shops that aren't operating at a high level of maturity. And that's not meant as, a, as an insult to anybody, it just means that maybe you're operating more as a startup, maybe where you don't, your things are, are, are more ad hoc, rather than you know, being well-defined and, and you adherence to the, to the standard is, is strictly enforced. So when you're looking at compliance and governance, you, know, you have to acknowledge that uh, automation gives you the ability to basically accomplish the same goals that you were doing before while doing so in a controlled fashion so that developer access to production no longer becomes an issue because simply the developers don't need to have access to production, but also more importantly, because you're only automating a well-defined and mature process that's going to be executed the same way every single time, you also have predictability 
-hmm. which really which really talks about the stability of the production environment. And this is the classic problem of DevOps, right? Development wants change. Operation says there are no way you're touching my production environment because I get measured on, on my six nines of uptime. Right. Mm -hmm. So being able to have a process that can give the operation side of DevOps predictability from a, a stability standpoint and you know an uptime standpoint is going to be crucial. So there's it's more than just compliance and governance. There's many more benefits that are associated with it, but certainly those two things can absolutely be addressed with automation. Okay, great. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for the question and answer period and as i said before if we didn't get to your question uh hopefully these guys will have some uh insight for you offline so um yeah. i do want to thank everybody for who did submit questions thank you very much i appreciate that and i also want to thank our panelists today we have carl levine and larry solomon thank you both for joining me today it was it was a pure pleasure i really really enjoyed our conversation well, i also thank want you to for having us I want to remind the audience that uh, today's event has been recorded, so if you missed any or all of it, you'll be receiving a link to access the webinar on demand. The webinar is also going to be on the DevOps.com website, so if you don't get your link for whatever reason, you can go to DevOps.com and listen to it there. Well, uh, we also have a ton of other webinars on DevOps.com, both upcoming and on demand, so uh, feel free to peruse and see if there's one or two or three or four or five or whatever that uh, pique your interest, hopefully there'll be some. Um, and then also a reminder that the ebook that uh, Extreme IT Automation that goes along with today's webinar is going to be uh, available tomorrow to you via a link that we'll be emailing over to you. So again, I'm going over time now, but uh, again, want to thank everybody for joining me. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, the moderator, and I bid you good day. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.